my privilege, my honor to once again to be before you and to bring God's word to you. It is my prayer that this morning as I speak, that I don't speak so much as Uncle Ken, but rather that I speak the heart of God. And so this morning I ask that the Lord anoint his word. I ask that the Lord hide his servant behind the cross, that Jesus be exalted this morning, and that this church will gain something from this morning's sermon message. In Jesus' name, amen. Last time I was here, I spoke about the Lord's house, whom we are. And last time, I basically wanted to impress upon you, to inculcate onto you that church is, is not the building, but church is the people. You remember that, right? How many of you were, heard that last time? Raise your hand. Right. Oh, the, the rest of you weren't here, and the others were sleeping, so you... <laughs> okay, no worries. So, as I was asked to come and share again, I thought, you know, what would I be sharing that is relevant? I could pull one of my old sermons out, you know, and uh, just regurgitate it again. But I thought, no, this church has been, I've been with this church for quite a while, and they're special. And I wanted to cook something special for you guys. And I thought about what I shared last time, the church, the Lord's house, whom we are. And it, the Holy Spirit impressed upon my heart, the Lord's house, whom we forgive, whom we love. Okay? And so... I'm talking about church, I'm talking about us, I'm talking about you guys as a church. And uh, the attributes of real families versus dysfunctional families. Just think about it. All right? Real families, they are bonded to each other. You got siblings, right? Doesn't matter. They get on your nerves, still your brother, still your sister. And you know that bond is so strong. And the Bible talks very, very clearly that we are bonded by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are family. So rather than saying good morning church, I should say good morning family right? You're family. You're together. Turn to your neighbor and say, you my family. <laughs> right? That's it. We are family. And because we are family, we forgive each other. We forgive each other. Husband and wife, you fight, but because you're family, you forgive. Brother and sister, brother and brother, sister and sister, you forgive. I'm going to show you later that this is not Ken Chong's clever idea, but this is Bible. As a church, we love each other in the Lord. I can't love you naturally, hmm? but in the Lord, I am able to love you. In the Lord, I am able to accept you. I know you're different to me, and I know I'm different to you. I'm very, um, you know, proactive. I'm always in people's face and I speak directly. And my wife always tells me, calm down. Don't be so direct. 
and we're different. Choleric, melancholic, and all those temperaments, we accept each other. And maybe you have a brother who is um, autistic or crippled or blind or whatever, you accept. And so we should build the Lord's house and in this local assembly, that should be our value. We should come together, greet one another and say, this is my spiritual family. Do I hear an amen? Do you agree? Do I hear an amen? Okay, okay. All right. So on the topic of forgiveness, this morning let me bring to you the parable of the unforgiving servant. And this is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? You see, Peter was trying to be cocky. He was trying to be clever. You see, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So do we count it on a little black book and you've reached your 77 times and now it's over? You know, you've been my brother all these 20 years and you've reached that mark. No, 77 times is a, what we, in English we call it a euphemism. It's like in the shop we sell 101 items. You don't go in the shop and count 101 items. It is like we sell so many. So Jesus was saying, you have to forgive your brother as many times. Forgive your sister as many times. And so he talks about, therefore, the kingdom of heaven. So you can either play church and be a church club, or you can be the church and be part of the kingdom of heaven. Your choice. You want to play church games and be a Christian club? I tell you, you won't survive. I've seen hundreds of them. Five years, ten years later, they finished. It's over. They're disintegrated. Because their basis of their foundation of faith has never been on the Bible, it's not been real, it's not been biblical. Only the Holy Spirit and the Word of God can keep us together. Only the Word of God and the Holy Spirit can make me forgive those who have done harm to me. All right? So, compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants, when he began to settle, one was brought before him who owed him 10,000 talents. I looked up what is talent, and you can Google it. Talent today is about $30,000. And so this is 10,000 times 30,000. That's how much this guy owed. And since he could not pay, his, martyred, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, and all he had and payment be made. In biblical times, it was like that. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. Out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. And here Jesus was going to compare when we sin against God, how many times have you sinned against God? How many times have I sinned against God? And every time you ask God to forgive you, every time you say you're sorry, could it be like 30,000 times 10,000? But let's have a look. But, but 
When the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. How much is a hundred denarii? A denarii, I looked it up, was $70. So a hundred times 70, 70. Seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, pleaded with me, have patience with me, I will pay you. Have patience with me, have patience always. You say God must have patience with you, but you don't have patience with your brother, with your sister. He refused. Went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And when we see unforgiveness take place in family, those of you that have two or more siblings, when you see your two brothers fight, it disturbs you, it upsets you. As a parent, when I see my, my sons fight, and there was big drama at one stage in my house, I won't go into details, but it grieved us. It grieved us. Big drama over one girl that came into our, and two brothers. Big drama. Anyway, I won't go into details. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave all the debt because you pleaded with me and you should and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? If God has forgiven us our sins, how we have hurt God, how we have sinned, how we have offended God, should we not then forgive those who insult us? maybe didn't invite us to a party or said something nasty about us. Small things, small issues. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart or your sister. <coughs> and you'll notice it's from your heart. You have to, as a Christian family, the Lord's house whom we forgive, we must learn to forgive. You are here in amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, we must learn to forgive. <coughs> right. Some truths about unforgiveness. It's your choice. If you don't forgive, you become a spiritual captive, a prisoner. Yeah. So when you forgive, you set yourself free by God's love and God's grace. Uncle Ken, Auntie May, we have been hurt so many times. We can tell you stories after stories and about so many times. But my colleagues that know me, the one attribute of Uncle Ken is that Uncle Ken is able to forgive and to let bygones be bygones. And maybe that's why at 73, I still have so much energy. Some of my friends are sick. They've got dementia, they ulcers. Don't ask God for healing when you're sick. Rather live in divine health. How do you live in divine health? You can live in physical health by doing exercise and having a good diet, etc. But in divine health, when you 
let go of all the stresses, all the mental and emotional stresses that accompanies unforgiveness, you have joy. You can let go. Decision is a, forg is a, is a dis uh, forgiveness is a decision. I'll never forget in South Africa, my eldership team, we had a meeting and man, they hurt me so bad. The things they said, sure. And when I drove home that night after the meeting, you know, tears while I was driving was coming down my face. And I thank God that my mentors taught me to speak out aloud. I was alone in my car driving home and I said, Lord, in Jesus' name, I forgive those elders who have said such ugly things this night. I didn't feel any different. The tears were still running down. But I said it. And when I said it, it's almost like something happens in the spiritual dimension. Something happens. I don't know what it is. So be careful of all the emotional stress that will affect you if you don't resolve unforgiveness. Because the acid burns more in the container stored. Than on the containers poured. How do you let go of all this acid? On your knees in prayer. If you want to tell somebody about it, tell Jesus. All right? When you do not forgive, you hurt yourself. You're not hurting that person. You're the one that can't sleep at night because every time you think about it, you roll your mind, your brain is like a video camera and you roll the incident around and around and around in your brain in, in color. And you can't sleep and you can't eat and you can't focus. They're sleeping fine. They're eating fine. You think they care. They don't care. No worries. They're sleeping fine. You're the one that's suffering. So take some word of advice this morning. Let's have a look at the unforgiveness, at the forgiveness of Jesus, which was our core scripture text this morning. All right. Jesus laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. The servants don't wear outer garments. The masters in the house, they wear three-piece suits and what. Jesus took out his outer garments, put a towel around his waist. He identified himself as a servant. He poured water in the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, wipe with the towel. Wow. If you do a research in biblical time, I'm telling you, the roads that you walk, the sidewalks that you walk in biblical times, is not as clean as here in Australia. Um, I come from Africa. Man, there's dog poo, there's horse poo, there's cow dung, there's rubbish, there's filth, there's open sewer. Hmm? And so your feet gets dirty. And to wash people's feet in the biblical house, who did that? That was the servant or the youngest family member would be asked to do that, to wash the feet of the guests. Here Jesus did that. And so that is why when he came to Simon Peter, he said, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus said, what I'm doing, you don't understand. Peter replied, you will never wash my feet. He 
put to his feet. You my master, you my boss, you my mentor, you my hero. How can I let you wash my dirty, stinking feet? Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no share, no part of me. Then Peter changed his tune. He said, Lord, if that's the case, then not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, all right, it's only your feet that I need to do this for you. But not all of you are clean. For he knew who was to betray him. So here's my question. We all know that Judas was sitting there, right? Or do you think Judas wasn't there? Was Judas there? Yes or no? Did Jesus wash Judas's feet or not? Did he come and say, oh, you're the one who betrayed me. Sorry, I'm not washing you. Okay, next. What do you think? Did he wash Judas's feet or not? Yes. Yes. Man, if I knew that this Judas was going to do that to me, I won't wash his feet. I'll take the basin and bash his head in. And take the towel and strangle him. But this morning, look at Jesus. When he had washed his feet, he put on his outer garments. Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Right? Do you see that? You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly I say to you, servants not greater than his master, and a messenger not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Another translation says, happy are you if you do them. Uncle Ken, are you saying we must get water now from the kitchen and start taking people's shoes off and wash our feet? I know in some churches they do that. Huh? They all, but my friend belonged to one of those churches and he was a very good friend of mine. And we worked together. And one Monday morning, he was really down. And I said, you know, Silas, what happened? Why are you so down? He said, you know, we washed one another's feet, then we had a meeting to discuss the church, and then an argument developed, and then we had a big fight, and two brothers actually punched each other physically. So what am I saying? What is this washing of feet? There's a very famous Christian writer called Watchman Nee. I don't know if you heard about him. Get some of his books, read some of his books. He talks about this washing of feet in a spiritual dimension that we can wash each other's feet spiritually, refresh each other. How do we do that? Caring for each other, loving each other, accepting each other. And so when I was pastoring the church, I wanted to bring some of biblical values into the church. And a rule I set and I'm not setting this rule. You have to bypass this with your leadership team. Listen to this. The rule I set is that when you come to church, don't go to your cliques. Make sure that, you've sh that you have greeted each person in the church. Shake hands with each one. My son is here. He'll testify. He had to go and say, Hello, Uncle Ben, Uncle, Uncle, Uncle Man, hello. Young, young people, sometimes you feel, oh, you know, these leaders, they do everything. They play keyboard, they, you know, what use have you got? 
I tell you what use have you got? You can go and say good morning to each person and to the visitors that come in and say good morning, welcome to our church. That is washing feet. That visitor who comes for the first time is refreshed. Wow. I leave that with you. Okay, so conclusion, before we go into break me of bread. God's church, attributes of real spiritual Christian family versus dysfunctional churches. Sorry to be so critical, um, but there's no perfect church, okay? All right? And when you find the perfect church, and you're really impressed by it, don't join it. Because when you join it, it's no longer perfect. <laughs> All right. So, God's church, we are blood bonded to each other. You know the gangsters, the Chinese triads, the mafia, and all these, they try to inculcate in their gang, we are brothers. And that's why the Hong Kong police, when they catch these, these Chinese triads, they will never betray their gang. You can beat him, you can kill him. He will never betray his gang. They even have a ritual, and you can Google it and watch it. They cut, each member cuts and drops blood into the, a bowl, mix it with some wine, and they pass it around like a, each one takes a, a cup, takes a sip. But we are bonded by Christ's blood. We are family. We accept each other. Not because I, I, I like it, but because of God's forgiveness. Because of God's forgiveness. And when we ministered in China to the Chinese church, you know the Chinese today have still, they haven't for, forgiven the Japanese for what they did in the Second World War. And I challenged the Chinese church because on Chinese National Day, it'll be crazy in the city. They'll smash Japanese cars. If you drive a Japanese car, you come to a filling station, they say there's no petrol for Japanese cars today. I challenged them. I said, I've got a pastor. Can I invite him to come and preach? Yes. He's Japanese. Silence. Okay, because of God's forgiveness, we forgive each other. We love each other in the Lord. In the Lord, we accept each other in God's agape love. All right? This church is called King's Agape, right? So agape is appropriate. Why? Because our focus is never on ourselves. Our focus is on Jesus. Amen. Good. Shall we come to close? Stand with me as we pray.